we have the pleasure of meeting an Irish geographer, the first Irish geographer in our series so far. Welcome, Joe. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to tell us a little of how you got into geography and uh, who, what influenced you and why did you stay in geography? It's difficult to know where to begin. I think it's well to remember that when I was young and at school in Ireland, geography was simply not taught by qualified geographers. Mm -hmm. There were historians, economists, anybody who could turn their hand at geography. Nevertheless, when I was at school, the uh, man who taught me geography, though he was a historian, certainly had a geographical sense. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the seeds were sown there. But it really goes back farther than that. I come from a family who used to go out every weekend into the mountains, walking, driving, looking at things. We always had an interest in, 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 in our surroundings. We didn't call it geography, we were just an outing. We enjoyed it. And when I was 12 years old, I was asked whether I would join the Dublin Naturalist Field Club. That field club had been in existence since the end of the 19th century, concerned mainly with botany, geology, entomology, and so on. And it was a club composed of very elderly people. Mm -hmm. Very little spark to it. <laughs> and Prager, Lloyd Prager, and Anthony Farrington and I think some others decided they would try to uh, make it a little bit more lively, so they produced this junior section. And I was one of the first junior members. So now I had a, a different uh, approach. We went out into the countryside, but now we were discussing what we saw from a scientific background. Mm -hmm. And of course, Farrington was the person who really inspired me because he would look at a section and go and say, golly, what is this? And mm -hmm. we'd discuss it and I got totally fascinated by this explanation of the landscape. It was mainly on the physical side. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I used to go out with the botanists and the ornithologists, so I got to know my birds, though I've forgotten a lot about birds now. I also learned the names of my plants which, incidentally, though I did some botany uh, in college, <laughs> had nothing to do with naming plants. It was all physiology. Mm -hmm. So at an early stage, in my early teens, I was looking at the landscape. I was going out with people like Prager mm -hmm. and Farrington, uh, Mason, and other people who uh, really inspired one. Now, I looked on this all as a recreation. I just thoroughly enjoyed it. So really, I began in the field. Yes. I didn't begin on any theoretic, theoretical background mm -hmm. or anything like mm -hmm. that, in the field. And I never thought of it uh, as being any sort of formal education. And indeed, my plans were to become an accountant. My mother wanted me to become a uh, a bank clerk, because she thought that was a nice, safe job with a pension. <laughs> that was the sort of things that <laughs> were considered important in those days. But anyway, this was a sort of compromise. I, I would go into accountancy. So when I entered Trinity, I intended to do a degree in commerce. Which year was this now? That was 1938, just before the war. It's a long time, a long time ago. <laughs> but. At the same time, my uh, history teacher in school had told me that there was a new man in Trinity, a geographer, and that courses were starting there, and I might be interested in thinking of doing a course in geography. This was Walter Freeman, yes? Which, of course, was Walter <laughs> Freeman. Um, I, of course, knew nothing about him then, but mm. this certainly was something that interested me, and yet, having organized my ideas into something different. It was a little bit uh, hard for me to change. So what I did was, in the first year, I attended lectures within the Faculty of Natural Science, which was where geography was located. 
and also in the Department of Commerce. Mm. At the end of that year, I was given an ultimatum from both faculties because, of course, the lectures clash. Yes. They, you just couldn't. I, I wasn't being single-minded enough. So I thought to myself, well, I'll do my first year examinations in commerce, and then I'll see what I'll do, because my examinations in the natural sciences was not in September, the other was June. I did my examinations in June, and I passed, just passed. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point I decided, really, my career didn't matter. My interests That's did. Right. So I decided I'd go right <coughs> over into natural yeah. science mm -hmm. and take geography. And there's no doubt about it that Freeman was an inspiring person. Mm. And I began to get my quite extensive knowledge of the landscape into mm. a new perspective, mm -hmm. a holistic view, which Freeman mm. certainly mm. had, mm. and uh, putting the thing into a regional context. Well, uh, the three years I in the department, uh, in those days one did three subjects up to moderatorship, yes. which is the honours mm -hmm. degree. I did geology, geography and uh, botany. Uh, then uh, as I progressed, my interest still lay on the physical side. I think the mm -hmm. inspiration of Farrington in particular, mm. and the whole area of glacial geology was opening up, or glacial yeah. studies was opening up in a big way. And Ireland, of course, was marvelous. You, you, were, you were finding the multiple glaciations, and all this, you know, it's ancient history now, but in those days it was opening up. Yeah. Frank Mitchell was working on pollen analysis for the first time, mm. having been inspired by Jensen, of course, from mm. Copenhagen. And there was a lot going on. But Freeman, of course, very much coming in from the human side, kept me on balance. Yes, yes. And though when I finally graduated and decided to do a, a higher degree, uh, my higher degree lay in the field of geomorphology. I still, my interests lay there. Well, after that, uh, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I had never visualized myself as being an academic. Mm -hmm. This is something I just mm -hmm. <laughs> never, never, never occurred to me. And I wasn't, as I say, at all sure what I would do, but I couldn't just hang around waiting for some sort of interesting job to come up. So I took a teaching job at, at the Royal Belfast Academical Institute. Uh -huh. to Belfast. In Belfast, yes. yes. Uh -huh. Belfast. Uh, teaching geography there. So really I began as, as a school teacher in a sense. Mm -hmm. That institution was interesting. It was, of course, a period when Belfast was having its air raids, so it was an uncomfortable time. Yes. Uh, I well remember shepherding the students into air raid shelters and pushing them in one end and them all coming out the other and going around and then the bombers would pass and we'd be back again into class. Mm -hmm. uh, very dramatic sort time, of situation. Yes dramatic time. But I enjoyed my time in Belfast. I found people extraordinarily warm-hearted. They were a nice community to work mm -hmm. in. And, mm -hmm. and uh, then, at the end of that, uh, Freeman asked me whether I'd like to come back to Dublin as his assistant. And I couldn't resist that, though the <laughs> pay was, yes. was yes. minuscule. And, mm -hmm. uh, but the opportunity seemed to be there, and I'd really got a taste yes. for And Trinity, yeah. without any question, was the the geography in Ireland at that time. It was the geography at, of Ireland at that, that time. Yes. That's correct. And it, it, you see, uh, I was the first graduate in geography through through that system. With uh, well, with, there were two others in the same year, so we were still a very small yes. band. Yes, yes. And when I got back to Trinity, Freeman, of course, was actively preparing to write his book on Ireland. Yes. It was systematically covering mm. the country. And I accompanied him on many of our trips. We would put our bikes on a train, go to some point, uh, take the bicycles off, and simply cycle around the countryside. Freeman was a great man for note-taking. 
yes. everything yes. went down. And that was a great lesson to me. Mm. Um, I tend to think, well, I'll remember this. This is mm. impressive. I, I can't possibly forget this particular scene or this particular mm. thing. But you do. Yes. A Freeman would put everything, even the most trivial thing, down. Yes. And his notebooks are fascinating. Yes, I could well imagine. Yes. Um, so there was that. But there was also another aspect which, to me, uh, was important. And that was that the Geographical Society of Ireland began to have its field trips. Uh -huh. They were founded when? Well, now, they were founded, uh, I think, the date, it's pre-war, I think around about 1932, uh -huh. but I'm not sure of the exact date. Again, Prager was important in this. Mm. Freeman, of course, was the person who really had to Got put it, it on, on, yes, on, yes. on, on, on a, a proper yes. uh, way. But the first field trip, which was to Virginia in County Cavan, um, was a one before Freeman took a hand in things. And it was a group of people interested in their own things. Um, some interested in clans, some interested in antiquities, mm. trying to interest it in the glaciology. And in the very first publication of Irish geography, which was called the Geographical Bullet, the Bulletin of Ireland then, um, they published the results in a set of totally disparate little articles. In other words, what geography just isn't. Yes. And this really stirred up Walter Freeman. Yes. <laughs> yes. And he was highly critical of this, a little bit unfairly, I think, because I feel that they were doing their best and they yeah. hadn't been put on, on, yeah. on, on, on the right track. Mm -hmm. And after that, he uh, began to organize mm -hmm. uh, a series of these. The next one to Gregna Manor was what I would consider to be the first real geographical field week mm -hmm. that we ever had in Ireland, organized by Walter Freeman who incidentally had had experience of this sort of thing with the Le Play Society. Yes, so it was a, a Geddes Le Play type. That's right, yes. that's, that, that's mm. right. Mm. And we, again, all tended to follow our own interests, but Gregna Manor was absolutely full of interest. And yes. we all began to realize how fascinating the Irish landscape is. If you begin to dig a little bit beneath it, they're just a fund of material yes. there. And that was written up in Irish geography and it was the first, I would say, real little micro region study uh -huh. in Ireland. Uh -huh. yes. And after that, then, a whole series of field weeks gradually becoming more organized, mm -hmm. especially on the human side. Mm -hmm. Questionnaires were developed mm -hmm. for the farming community, for example, so that mm -hmm. the data would be comparable mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think the, uh, these field trips were one of the most important aspects of the early development of mm. geography in the country. Did you feel uh, in Trinity that you were uh, an integral part of the southern Irish population or did you feel it was a kind of island of uh, elite scholarship separate from us peasants? <laughs> I don't think I was aware of that. I think I was more aware of that in retrospect. Yes. But at the time, it seemed natural to me, my, my connections had been, though mind you, my background is farming from County Wexford. Yes, yes. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it didn't strike me as being elite. Mm. But I realized, looking back, of course, that it, it was. It probably was. It was, it was. Yes. But <coughs> to some extent, for me, that was, uh, that was offset by the fact that the Geographical Society of Ireland mm. in those days was certainly not Trinity at all. Freeman, yes, but the yeah. great majority, the, 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 the committee and so on, were ordinary citizens of Dublin, a good cross-section. Not school teachers either, were they? There were some school teachers, teachers, yes, yes. And from some of the Catholic schools, it was important because yes. they drawn in, in other words, mm. there mightn't be. And exactly the same in the Naturalist Field Club. Again, mm. a cross-section there, primarily of non-academic people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the sad things, in a way, about the Geographical Society of Ireland was that it was taken over by the academics. Uh -huh. yes, yes. As it is now. Yes. It's run mm -hmm. by academics. And the ordinary man in the street is mm. not attracted in the way 
mm. he was or she was mm. in days gone by. Mm. Mm. But geography at Trinity was never, uh, in a way, uh, involved in rebellion or revolution or radical movements. It was quite status quo, wasn't it? It was it? very much so, yes, yes very much mm. so. And I suppose the real development didn't occur really until the 1950s when, well, Freeman had gone and I had taken over and at last we were getting some more staff because really Freeman and I were the geography department for a very long time. And you tend to be a little bit conservative under those situa that, that situation. It's not, it's not easy to move forward. But from the, in the 50s and early 60s, dramatic increase in staff and of course the uh, department in UCD developing yes. very quickly as well. When, yes. When did that begin, UCD? I think that uh, UCD began a little later than Trinity, but they had a chair before we had. I see. Didn't realize I think, that. I think John Hughes got his chair just before. I see. I, I see. did. Uh, and, uh, but it was wonderful to have a developing group there. Nearby, yes. And our link, of course, was uh, in the uh, was was in the geographical society. But apart from that, mm. we were two rather separate organizations. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. In spite of the fact that we didn't really wish it to be that way, mm. but that's just the way things were. Yes. It was a physical separation. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, in Cork, still in the 1950s, end of the 50s, there was only one professor. Yes, And yes. he had to do everything. That's right. He was a marvelous one, incidentally, but it was a, there has been an enormous mm. development since the 60s. I yes. was giving 14, 15 hours of lectures a week. Yes. No, covering almost everything. Yes, yes. And how can you really be an inspiration to students? And how can you move on into a real research situation? When you're so much Unless you can yes. really specialize. Yes. But you did develop research interests in Africa particularly. Yes. Well, I st yeah. tried very hard along the line to, to keep a little. I, did, I haven't done very much writing, but Originally, of course, I was concerned with these field trips uh, of the Geographical Society, and I have written up a number of them, and for me that was an important, a very important part of my activity. But in 1963, um, I went to Lagos to help set up the University of Lagos in Nigeria, and um, I was also the first dean of the Faculty of Arts. Now, my interest in Africa dates back quite a long way. It dates back to the immediate post-war period when many Africans came to Dublin, especially Nigerians, yes, yes. mainly doing professional courses, medical, um, well, mainly medical, some engineering, um, law. Mm. And there was a big uh, link, certainly between Trinity yes. and Nigeria. But one of the things I was concerned with was looking after uh, students' accommodation. One of the many little yes, odd things one gets them. landed with at a university like Dublin. And I was secretary of the House of Residence uh, Committee. And in that capacity, I realized that these uh, students were coming from Africa without adequate preparation nowhere to stay, mm. Dublin landladies were not very sympathetic towards them, and understandably because though they were prepared to take one or two, immediately they took one or two, then oh, it became yes. a complete little ghetto of yes. Africans. So I was very concerned about that, mm. and I was a small Quaker committee that used to meet these people when they came. And try to help them with accommodation, and I searched out uh, possible lodging. I approached landladies and so on. This is hardly yeah. geographical activity, but anyway. it was part of my, you know, part of my learning. So I had this contact, and I knew a number of Nigerians. Well, so this contact with Nigeria was not something out of the blue. It was something yes. that had gradually developed. Oh, I see. Yes, and you have continued along those lines. And I've continued. Yes. I mean, when I was in Lagos, well, I. One of the things I took an interest in then was the whole question of tro urban tropical development. Mm -hmm. and Lagos, of course, is a yes. marvelous place to start asking questions. Yes. 
Um, though I didn't have as much time to do research as I could have wished because, unfortunately, I got caught up with political affairs in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And eventually I had to come home sooner than I had expected. Mm -hmm. A situation which uh, simply arose out of matters which were totally outside one's control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tribal situation, which yes. we got caught, caught, caught yes. up in. Yes. But I've been back to Nigeria mm. a number of times since. Mm. Mm. But my knowledge of Africa is not just there. I have a sort of sense of adventure, and o o I've always travelled. And my travelling, for example, I've uh, travelled down Nile. I set out from Uganda and simply yes. set out and crossed into Sudan though I hadn't any permission, was arrested there, but let go and continue, came through the Sud swamps, Egypt, Alexandria, then to Greece, then to Istanbul, home by the old Orient Express in the days that it was the Orient Express. And I've, at the time the IGU, many years ago, met in Rio. I took the opportunity for tramping over most of South America. I crossed from the Transandino to uh, Chile, worked my way up, through Uruguay, southern Brazil, by lo local transport and bus, Fantastic. and so on. And I've done that for most parts of the world. Do you Suddenly enjoy it. <laughs> That's, I think it's fun. So you have had the most marvelously dramatic trips, <laughs> journeys, on foot and on water and over the ocean. Um, but the nice thing is you, you enjoy it all, and yet you feel you're being a real geographer when you're out in the field. Marvelous. You have no problem of conscience. None at all. I mean, <laughs> geography is to be enjoyed. Any academic subject is to be enjoyed, after all. I mean, uh, this is just, uh, geography is part of my life. Um, when I was uh, interested in uh, glaciation, I felt that I ought to see a, a glaciation somewhere or other so that I could measure it up against what I saw in Ireland. But having very little money at the time and very few resources, I decided I'd try to hitch a lift to Spitsbergen, Svalbard. With very little preparation, I went to Norway. I got in touch with uh, a man who owned a shipping line, Jakob Kjoda of Bergen, who was at that time uh, taking coal, bringing coal back from Spitsbergen, and persuaded him to allow me to go north in one of his ships, which I did. I brought a little tent with me, uh, very little equipment, and when I got to Spitsbergen, I set out. First of all, I climbed Mount Nordenskjöld. Uh -huh. I knew there was an old Swedish Met station on the top, yes. and that I could get shelter in it. But uh -huh. when I got there, the snow was above the level of the station. It had been closed during the war. Uh -huh. and, but I broke open the roof and went <laughs> inside and got some shelter. Beautiful instruments and everything, all there had been abandoned when war broke out. However, this was part uh, of uh, my getting to know what glaciation was all about, but of course pleasurable too. Looking back on it, I realized how foolish I was to be alone yes. for four days on one occasion without seeing anybody. Yes. I could twist an ankle or anything, but you don't think about those no, things no. when you're young, and, and twist if you did, you'd never do anything. Right, right, right. Well, I think that's an essential part <laughs> of many of the physical geographers I've met. Their experience was the, the romance of getting lost in the wilderness, as it were. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. But you also did a lot of work back home, and, and what I read first, I think, was your, not first, but very soon after I got to know you, was your work with the Atlas of Ireland. Yes. Do you like to describe a little of the background to that? Well, of course, as a geographer, cartography is, 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 is my background to everything. And if you can't map it, then it's not very geographical. So that cartography ha has always been an interest of mine. Um, now, several attempts have been made to make an atlas of Ireland, but they had failed for various reasons. And an opportunity arose um, through the fact that I had been elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy, the first geographer to be elected. The Royal Irish Academy is a rather elitist <laughs> organization, and uh, you step into dead men's shoes there. You yeah. know that the number of places available is very small. But <clears throat> my non-geographers uh, were very anxious there should be a geographer in there, mm. and so. Now, this gave me an interesting opportunity, because the Royal Irish Academy is an all-Ireland institution and not attached to any university. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if we're going to make a national atlas, I need the cooperation 
all the universities, yes. government departments, north and south of the border, mm. and that the academy would be a, a proper place in which to seek this. So it was a diplomatic mm. uh, approach, really, mm. through the academy. And this worked extremely well. I got the cooperation of government departments north and south of the border, uh, the Ordnance Survey in the north, the Ordnance Survey in the south, Queen's University, and the other universities. And without that, of course, it would have been impossible. Yes. yes. Because, in fact, all these organizations provided material without any cost at all. That there were no fees paid to anybody who contributed to that atlas. Yes. And that, I consider, a quite remarkable situation. Well, it's, it's a bit Irish, too, isn't it? A bit it? Irish, too, but <laughs> it couldn't have been done otherwise, because no. the total outlay on it is a you know, quarter of a million pounds. And I just, there was no way in Ireland that you'd get that money right. initially. Right. Yes. But yes. the atlas is sold out now. It's become a museum piece. I mean, it's become a collector's piece. There won't be a, a re-edition? Well, I mm. hope there will be. Yes. I wonder whether perhaps the... Uh, 18, uh, 1991 census might be the basis yes. for it. Oh, it's, it's really fine. The plates are all there. Mm, right. Yes, fine. But in, on geography in general in Ireland, do you think Trinity has been a pace setter for the other places, or are there two different kinds of geography going on? In I wouldn't like to say that uh, Trinity was a pace setter. Mm. I'd say that originally the impetus came from the Queen, Queen's University in Eston Evans. Mm. Uh, he was a very uh, powerful figure in, in his own way, though some of us felt that from the point of view of geography, his emphasis on folklore and folk life was uh, getting a little bit off track. Nevertheless, I, I think it's impossible to underestimate the importance of that department. Oh, yes, Eston Evans is very highly respected in North America and in yes, many yes, places. Indeed. Yes, indeed. And I, I think <coughs> he's a marvelous person. Yes. And of course, happily still with us, though his yes. sight is Yes. Now. Mm. I think that was important. And I had very useful contacts with Eston. And indeed, when Eston went to America shortly after the war, he invited me to go and run Queen's Department. But I didn't go for various reasons, mm. which uh, yes. I would prefer not to go talk into. about here, though I, I would, in a way I would like to have done. Mm. But it was as, that link as close as that. Mm. Well, then I think Trinity was important. But I wouldn't like to say that we're a trendsetter now. I think UCD, roughly the same staff, mm. um, has uh, really taken on quite a number of the functions that Trinity did. At one time, Trinity uh, edited Irish geography, edited the Journal of the Teachers Association, mm. uh, you know, had mm. really all the major activities within its grasp. But I don't think that's so now. Mm. I think that we're very much on level. I think that Cork, for example, has definitely come up and is making its mark, <laughs> yeah. uh, more so than it ever did before. Mm. Mm. I think I think there's a very important department in Cork. And yes. I think it's, uh, well, you better it's, think it's that. Well, yes. this is my <laughs> I know order. that yes. indeed. I'm not just saying that because yes. I do believe that yes. because I feel that Willie Smith is, is yes. really marvelous. a marvellous person, yeah. just the right appointment. Yes. And I'm glad to say that I was one of the appointments committee that appointed him to Maynooth in the first instance. I'm so there's a link that. there oh, good. going way yes. back too. Yes. So yeah. I've had my finger in a good many. Uh, that's what I've suspected, yes, yes, yes. And what is your hope for geography in the future, the future of geography in Ireland? Do you, do you see possibilities opening up? I, I think that one can take a fairly optimistic view, but that's not the view taken by a number of my colleagues mm. who see the uh, fact that geography in the leaving certificate now, in the state examinations, mm. doesn't have quite the status that it did. There are, I think there's only one inspector of geography now in the department. There are a number of vacancies, but they haven't filled them. And there's a, the, 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 the Royal Ash Academy um, through one of its subcommissions, uh, subcommittees on geography is making big efforts to do something about this. But, mm. you know, if geography is not healthy in the schools, yes. it doesn't bode well it, for it, the universities. Yes. I'm happy about the situation in the universities. I think, I think at the moment, well, perhaps we're on the top of a wave, I don't know. Mm. Because, of course, there are constraints on replacements and so on, though mm. I'm glad to say that my successor has been appointed without any any, any problems. But I don't see much 
more development at the moment, except that uh, I see a move into the applied side. There's an awareness among geographers that unless they do more applied geography, their relevance is not mm. to be seen. Mm. And certainly, there has been more of that mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. And I would see that is the way geography is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, though I hope there always remain the academics who will study just for yes. <laughs> um, study's sake. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you have retired just this year. That's right, right. yes. But you haven't uh, stopped your work or your travel. Well. I hope to do a little bit of writing now because for a very long period when I was running the department practically single-handed, I just couldn't put a pen to paper. I, it, it, was, it was quite impossible. Mm -hmm. Just had no space of time in which to mm -hmm. settle down and, and, and do anything really constructive. Um, so I do hope to do a bit of that. I also am involved in development agencies, yes. both the uh, Freedom from Hunger Council, Goethe, and also the Catholic Bishops Fund for Development, Procura, mm -hmm. of which I'm on the Executive Committee and on the Projects Committee. And within Procura, I'm interested in uh, Central and South America, yes. and will be visiting there shortly. Mm -hmm. For Goethe, I'm mainly uh, interested in Southeast Asia, and this year I've already been to India in January, February, looking at uh, agricultural projects in that part of the world. So, oh, I see no end to my travel and my enjoyment of life, which is, I think, the important thing. Well, that's a good note on which to bring this interview to a close. Joe, you've given me a lot of inspiration, and I'm certainly many generations of students that have gone through Trinity since you first came there. Thank you ever so much, and bon chance. Thank you very much, indeed. Yeah. <laughs>